Through Fire and Water, The Life of Reb Nussin of Breslov. We are up to chapter 14, To Zaslov. Sometime before Purim, March of 1807, Rabbi Nachman left Breslov on a mysterious journey to the region northwest of Kiev, where he visited the cities of Navarich, Ostrog, Brody, and Zaslov. Nothing is known about the purpose of the Rebbe's journey. Before setting off, he clapped his hands and said, Now something new is beginning. If people knew the reason for this trip, they would kiss my footsteps. With every step, I am bringing the world to the scale of merit. Soon after Purim, the Rebbe arrived in Ostrog, from where he wrote to his followers in Breslov requesting expense money. He told them that he did not feel well and asked the Hasidim to pray for him. Reb Naftali, who was keeping Reb Nassim posted about all the developments in Breslov, wrote to him in Moelov, informing him about the Rebbe's letter. By now, Reb Nassim and his family had all recovered. Reb Nassim left immediately for Nemirov, where he spoke at length to Reb Naftali. The latter told him all that he had heard from the Rebbe during Reb Nassim's absence, including several new stories. These had not been transcribed, since there was nobody there to do so. Reb Nassim rejoiced that he had traveled then, for had he waited, these stories would have been lost forever. From Nemirov, Reb Nassim wrote to the Rebbe, After seeing a copy of the letter of our master and teacher forwarded to me by Reb Naftali, I stood trembling and shaking and was gripped with pangs of fear. Beloved master, teacher, and Rebbe, beloved of the Supreme One and of all the souls of Israel, beloved of our soul, what can I say? If I thought to comfort our master and teacher and speak to his heart, who could gird his loins and put his head into such a task? Surely our master has not forgotten the difficult times that have passed over him all his life until this day, until God helped him and he merited to break, tear down, demolish, and destroy all the obstacles and built what he built and ascend to the place he ascended. Even if all this is hidden from the eye of all living beings, and even if it be true that never until now has he suffered a time like the present, we surely trust in God that we will yet be worthy to see his joy soon. As for us, we are carrying out his instructions to pray for him. May God have pity on us and upon all his people Israel and arouse our hearts to pray in the proper way about a matter of such importance. If we had even the least sensitivity, we should be shrieking out in the streets and public places in order to stir up the love of the supreme God for him for ourselves and for all his creation, since we are lying in the place we have sunk to and are waiting and hoping to take refuge under his wings. The pity is especially great on me, for he lifted me up from the lowest dust and raised me up from the scrap heap of my poverty and seated me among princes. And I am still naked without garments, and who knows if I have even reached the stage of a suckling child. And I have none other to suck from and draw blessing and vitality except to our master and teacher, who is our life and the length of days. Before Pesach, the Rebbe sent one of his followers to Breslov to bring his wife to Ostrog. She was suffering from tuberculosis, and the Rebbe wanted her to be treated by the saintly Rebbe Aaron ben Shimon Rofe, otherwise known as Dr. Gordon. However, the Rebbeson wanted to be treated in Zaslov, and they went there immediately before Pesach. Reb Nassim remained in Nemirov until after Pesach. He then went to Breslov to speak to Moshe Chinkis and ask him to send money to Navarich to cover the Rebbe's expenses, which he did. Reb Nassim then returned to Moalov. After Pesach, Rabbi Nachman wrote to the Breslov Hasidim that he was very ill and asked that they pray for him. But a little later, he wrote again, saying that he was feeling stronger despite not having resorted to physical cures. These letters were also forwarded to Reb Nassim in Moalov. <clears throat> it was customary for the Breslover Hasidim to gather with the Rebbe for Shavuos, but knowing that he would be delayed in Zaslov for a few months, the Rebbe wrote to his Hasidim that no one should attempt to come to him there this year. The trip was arduous, a distance about, of about 100 miles, a four-day journey from Breslov. However, Reb Naftali, who was often in Breslov and saw the Rebbe's letter before anyone else, immediately wrote to Reb Nassim and many other Breslover Hasidim to make sure that they did travel to the Rebbe for Shavuos. Rav Nassim was in a total quandary as to what to do. The Rebbe had said not to come, but he knew he should be with him for Shavuos. 
Reb Nussin's trial was made all the more acute by the fact that his father-in-law, to whom people used to come from all the surrounding towns and villages to ask him to adjudicate in their disputes, was intending to travel to Kremenitz directly after Shavuos. He had told Reb Nussin that he wanted him to stay in Moalev to deputize for him. What was Reb Nussin to do? Whichever way he decided, it was going to be very costly. To travel to Zaslav would be literally walking out on Reb David Svi. But in the end, Reb Nussin's desire to be with Rabbi Nachman overcame all his doubts. When he came home to pack what he needed for the trip, Esther Shandl was beside herself and started crying bitterly, though she knew there was no stopping him. He then went to take leave of his in-laws, who were extremely angry and did everything in their power to stop him. But Reb Nussin did not flinch. He took his things and left. He had no money for expenses, but God was with him, and he met two people who loaned him the necessary amount for the trip. And his mazal, a coach had arrived in Nemrov and was returning that day. Everything happened very quickly, and so Reb Nussin set off for Nemerov. From there, he would go on to Breslov, meet up with the other Breslov or Hasidim over Shabbos, and travel to Zaslov on Sunday. He writes, it would be impossible to describe the doubts I had about making that trip, the severity of the obstacles I faced, and the intensity of the suffering I went through. But God helped me overcome all the obstacles. I finally made my decision to travel, and despite the fact that I was left with very little time for such a long journey, God immediately provided me with a coach and some expense money. That is the way God does things. Whoever wants to be helped is helped. Even though there are seemingly endless and insurmountable obstacles, still, they are all in the mind. As soon as one mobilizes the necessary desire and willpower and truly yearns to complete the holy task, one can certainly overcome all obstacles. Reb Nassim set off for Nemerov in the early afternoon of Thursday, June 4th. He needed to reach Breslov before Shabbos in order to join the others, since they would be leaving for Zaslov soon after Shabbos. Reb Nassim's worry was that he might not arrive in Nemerov sufficiently early on Friday to be able to find a coach that would bring him to Breslov in time for Shabbos. It would be impossible to pass through Nemerov without visiting his father, but he knew how opposed he would be to his making this journey in the first place. The displeasure he would have at Reb sudden arrival on a Friday afternoon and immediate departure could not be minimized. Reb was hoping that the wagon driver would push hard and that they would reach the outskirts of Nemrov early enough for him to be able to hire a coach directly to Breslov instead of making a detour into Nemrov. Reb Nassim writes, Even when, when one begins one's travels, having overcome the first set of obstacles, another set appears on the scene. This was so during our travels to Rabbi Nachman during his lifetime, and it is so after his passing when we travel to his gravesite. There are always obstacles to face. And so, as they left Moalev, Reb Nussin noticed that the coach he was traveling in was very large, but it only had two horses, whereas a coach that size usually had four, or at least three. Reb Nussin asked the driver why. The other horse took sick a few miles before Moalev, replied the driver. I had to leave it there. We'll pick it up on the way back. They lost some time because of this, but Reb Nussin was still hoping they would be able to make it up. Shortly afterwards, before they even reached the village where the sick horse was, it started raining, making the road very muddy, and this slowed them down even more. Finally, they arrived in the village, only to receive the good news that the horse had died. More time was lost as the coach driver mourned his loss and then made arrangements to sell the carcass and hides. By the time they left, it was getting dark, and they stopped for the night only 10 miles or so from Moalev with still another 35 miles to go to Nemerov. Reb Nussin woke up on Friday morning with a broken heart. He had no idea what to do. That morning, they made very slow progress, and it was almost midday by the time they came to Marchev, a town some 20 miles from Nemerov. Reb Nussin writes, It was now almost impossible for me to reach even Nemerov before Shabbos, let alone hire a coach to Breslov somewhere along the way. But if I didn't make it to Breslov until after Shabbos, I wouldn't have a coach or friends to travel with to Zaslov. 
I began to consider hiring a horse to ride to Breslov, but Marchev was a small town, and fast horses are not usually available there. Besides, I didn't have enough money to hire a horse. Just as we were about to enter Marchev, as we were crossing the bridge, I prayed, Ribono Shalolam, master of the universe, provide me with a wagon and four horses that will take me to Breslov, free of charge. Even the driver heard me. We came to an inn, and the driver took a break to feed his horses. I also sat down to eat. I had just washed my hands for bread and was about to recite Hamotzi when the coach driver came running to me shouting, Reb Nassan, your prayers are answered. Just now a wagon arrived with four horses and it is continuing on to Breslov. The merchant it belongs to knows you and is willing to take you along for nothing. Reb Nassan was overwhelmed. He immediately made the blessing over the bread, ate a little and went out to the wagon. The merchant took Reb Nassan along with him and they arrived in Breslov with time to spare before Shabbos. There was no more room on the coach to Zaslav, but there was enough time to hire another coach for Reb Nassan and another Chassid who came for the journey. They left on Sunday, Rosh Chodesh Sivan, June 7th, arriving in Zaslav on Wednesday. Shavuos was the following night. Reb Nassan writes, I saw the hand of God guiding me the whole way and how he hears every prayer. My prayer was fulfilled down to the last detail. Blessed is he who hears the prayers of all lips. This is the way it is for all who seek holiness. I've written about this journey at some length in order to inform the generations to come of the obstacles we had to overcome. All the Rebbe's other followers also had all kinds of similar obstacles. Many fell away because they could not stand up to such an onslaught of obstacles and they lost what they lost. Fortunate are those who stayed firm and fought until they broke through all the barriers and attached themselves to the Rebbe, bringing merit on themselves, on the generations to come, and on the entire Jewish people. When the Hasidim arrived in Zaslav, they went to a small synagogue known as the Taylor's Shoal, where they prayed loudly in their usual way. This was especially so when they recited Sefer Omer. The Shamas complained to Rabbi Nachman that some strange Hasidim had come to town and had taken over the Shoal, and they were praying for such a long time that he couldn't lock up the shul at the usual time. The Rebbe just smiled, and the shamas then understood that these were the Rebbe's chassidim. On Thursday afternoon, Erev Yom Tov, just before Mincha, the Rebbe's wife passed away. Rabbi Nachman was present in the room when she breathed her last. He later said that when she died, he was so grief-stricken that he had great difficulty keeping in mind the rectifications that would help her soul. But God was with him and he succeeded. The burial society worked swiftly to ensure that the burial could take place before Yom Tov, leaving time for the Rebbe to sit for the required mourning period before the onset of the festival. This was also beneficial for those who came to him for Shavuos, as it meant that he was able to teach a lesson. He ended up teaching Lakuti Maran Lesson Samach Zayin 67, which speaks about the passing of a soul. The Rebbe did not speak with his followers the entire first night of Shavuos. At the meal, he studied Torah between the courses. He then sat with his followers to recite the Tikkun Lel Shavuos during the night and went to the mikvah before daybreak. At the morning meal, also, the Rebbe hardly said a word. Only on Friday evening did he put on his strimal for the first time that Yom Tif. And afterwards, his face began to brighten a little, and he sang Ato Niglesa to a beautiful melody. He then sat up the whole night with some of his followers. At the third meal on Shabbos, he taught his lesson. And on Motzei Shabbos, he again sat up with his followers all night. Rav Nassan writes, Thank God for helping us at that tragic time. Despite the fact that his wife had just died, we did not lose the lesson we needed to receive. Despite the great pain he was going through, he sat up with us for three nights in succession. He had the most amazing way. His wisdom and holiness were such that nothing had the power to throw him off his balance. We could see that he was going through the most terrible pain, as he himself indicated in some of his remarks, but this did not stop him from working to elevate us spiritually. When the Rebbe left the room for a short while that Saturday night, Reb Nassan and Reb Naftali, who were completely exhausted, having been awake for three nights, lay down on the floor to sleep. When the Rebbe came back and saw them, he said, 
why are you sleeping your lives away? They immediately stood up. On Sunday, Rab Nassim recorded the Rebbe's lesson and showed it to him. He then took leave of the Rebbe. Rab Nassim first traveled to Nemerov, where he went to visit his father. However, the latter was extremely angry with Rab Nassim, both for having turned down the rabbinical position in Moalev and for going to Zaslav for Shavuos. Rab Naftali Hertz refused to allow Rab Nassim into his house. He went to his sister, where he stayed until after Shabbos. He then went to Breslov. He writes, I was bewildered and troubled. I had nowhere to turn to except God. The Rebbe was not in Breslov. I would find no peace in my father's house. He simply refused to have me there. In Moalev, my in-laws had left me no doubt as to what they thought of my traveling to Zaslov. I had gone anyway. How was I to go back there? Reb Nassim waited in Breslov for a few days and then decided to go back to Mohalev. When he arrived, he found that his in-laws had already left for Kremenitz. This somewhat eased the pressures on him, and Reb Nassim remained in Mohalev for the rest of the summer.